Good morning. It's good to be back. Good to be in the house of the Lord uh, and fellowshipping together to see everybody and uh, welcome those online as well. Uh, today we got uh, a few announcements. Uh, one thing I wanted to say uh, yesterday, it was really cool that um, the Demarius Lives run, we had a lot of our church, we had like about 20 or so volunteers from our church putting that on, uh, helping put that on. Uh, Janet Wisenhunt did an amazing job, um, and Sierra uh, putting that. That was a, a run to, uh, to remember Demarius, support the Cox family, um, as well as provide scholarships for students. And over $5,000 was raised yesterday, and that was really awesome. Um, there was a big turnout, and a lot of, a lot of our people were there. That was good to see um, those who could make it out. Um, there was probably, I don't know, I was just estimating, I think there was at least 400 people there. It was really neat. Um, today, uh, after the service, we are going to go, and everybody's welcome, member or, or not, everybody's welcome to go over into the fellowship hall for the uh, annual family meeting, and uh, we're going to go over some uh, a little bit voting on the budget, as well as I'll be sharing uh, some of the vision uh, for the church. And, um, and then we will have a fundraiser meal, and there's been some questions about that. Um, you know, due to COVID, we were going to, you know, we were going to, um, before COVID, pack up uh, or just bring a lot of supplies here and have a fun packing party as a church, as a way of, uh, for Operation Christmas Child, packing shoe boxes uh, together, and it'd be a great event. Well, not everybody, because of COVID, can do that now and stuff. So things are getting modified and changed and, and such. But we still are going to, you know, pack, have a shoe box packing party. You can either pack your own shoe box at home uh, or we'll have the, the packing party. But when we're doing the packing party, we're making a bunch of boxes, boy, somebody's got to pay for the shipping. And so the fundraiser meal today um, is to, uh, to help with the cost of shipping. So the, the meal is free. It, it's uh, cinnamon roll uh, and fruit, um, and uh, you don't have to pay for anything. You can just come over there and, and, and have some of that. But if you can donate even a dollar, two, three, ten, fifty, whatever, to help pay for the packing, every box it costs nine dollars to ship. And so uh, to get these four hundred boxes that we're go setting a goal for out, that's going to be thirty six hundred dollars. So yeah, do the math. All right. Uh, then uh, at the, after the annual meeting, um, two or before the annual meeting, at the end of the service today, we have Kellen and Marissa here. And they are missionaries of ours, and they're going to share at the end of the service. After the doxology, I'll introduce them, and then we're going to have to cut the live feed. So those at home will say goodbye to you, and they're going to share in here. But because of the sensitivity of where they are serving, uh, we cannot uh, televise that. And uh, so um, those here this morning will get to hear um, a, a, an update from them, but tonight they'll share more. And so if you're at home and missed this, if you can come out tonight at 6.30, there will be more. And if you hear it this morning, uh, you're still going to have more to hear tonight uh, in a longer time at a dessert night at 6.30. So at 6.30, come back for um, a dessert night to hear from them. Um, and then tomorrow morning, uh, if you remember, there's, there's uh, details on this there's, to meet them individually or more intimately at Rhubarb Market. And you can see the time uh, at the table in the back. Membership class. If you're thinking about becoming a member, um, and we've got some people that are doing that that will be in this class next Sunday, or you're thinking about baptism, or just want to know more about the church, what are we all about? Uh, you don't have to, you're not committing to becoming a member, but uh, if, you, if you're curious, come out next Sunday right after the service. We will have um, a class, takes about three hours that I'll be doing. We'll provide lunch. And uh, so just if, if you're interested in that, email me so that we can get information to you uh, or write on your communication card, membership class. But ne uh, next Sunday it will be. So, um, and then communion. We're going to have communion next Sunday. And we will have 
individual. Normally, you know, I know when I came on as lead pastor, I started doing it on the first of every Sunday. COVID changed things up quite a bit. And so I've been waiting to get these communion cups and the wafers that are prepackaged all together and stuff. Uh, they are here now. And so um, tomorrow... Or next Sunday, we will have that. When you come, you can just grab a cup and come into the uh, service with that and hold that till it's time so we won't be passing anything. If you're at home, if you want to come and get one during the week, you can do that or just buy your own grape juice and, and some bread at your house and you can have um, your elements there and take communion along with us. We will do that combined in church and uh, virtually so because we are one body even though we aren't all physically present to, together. Um, and I think normally it's great to do that when you're all physically present, but, you know, it's COVID. These are unusual times, and I think we can make an exception to do it um, virtually. Uh, then uh, last thing is October 4th, the next Sunday, will be uh, Tabor Sunday, and we are hosting that. We are the fourth in line uh, this year, but we didn't want to be the first uh, with having to change everything. Um, so we're, we're, we're bumped back to the fourth. So they are, uh, a lot of Tabor students are at Grace today, and they'll be at Parkview next week, and all, and they were Abenfeld last week. They've all been doing meals for them. We are going to do a meal for them, and um, it's going to be a brunch. And so, and it's going to be an outdoor service. So bring your lawn chairs, uh, and it's going to be eating in, your, in our laps. And we will be doing that out where we had the, the outdoor service before. We've been wanting to do another one in the fall. People really like the, the outdoor service we did in the spring and said, let's do it again in the fall. And so we are going to do that again with the Tabor students and uh, welcome them. And so um, that will be 930 as usual. On October 4th, weather permit, permitting, if we have problems with the weather, we will adjust to an indoor um, service. All right, that's all I've got. If you're a guest with us today, I'd love to, uh, to meet you. I'll be out at the welcome table afterwards. Come and uh, find me there and uh, say hi. And let's, let's pray as we uh, begin our, the rest of our service. Lord God, I thank you for what you're doing. It is good uh, to be in your house it's, uh, as the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And we come this morning with gladness. Glad to have this opportunity to, to see one another, to fellowship together. Even if we're having to do that virtually, uh, we are still one body and celebrate together and worship you together. Lord, we uh, pray that you would take the tithes and offerings. Uh, for some, it's a real sacrifice during this time, and you know, you know our finances, you know, you know the times, we don't have to tell you. Uh, but I thank you that you see us, that you love us, that you provide for us. If we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, you said that you will add all these things. You will take care of our needs, our physical needs. And so we trust you, Lord. Uh, take the tithes and offerings um, as an act of worship, a way to say that, Lord, you are in control and we trust you. You are a good, good father. Father, we ask your blessing on the rest of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my
teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Because Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Thank you, Holly. Uh, when I was uh, younger, you know, <clears throat> my dad would have chores for us to do. He'd cut branches, and we'd, we were the ones that had to haul them off uh, to the bin all the time and stuff. And he had different chores for us to do in the yard. And one of the things he always said or often said to us was, walk like a man with a mission. And I didn't fully understand it until I had kids. Uh, <laughs> and uh, now, you know, they're frustrating uh, a lot of times because, you know, as a kid, you know, we're just walking like this and just taking our time. And he's like, you know, there's, there's work to do, you know. I, we got to get going here, you know. And, and uh, so, he's, you know, he's get on our case. Walk like a man with a mission. Walk like a man with a mission. That's what Jesus is telling us today in this story. We've got a mission and we got to walk like a people on a mission. Let's read uh, as we continue in Luke 19. We're going to skip the story of Zacchaeus because um, Tracy Halladier preached on that while I was gone and did a great job with that. I think that uh, we don't need to rehash uh, Zacchaeus, but that fits in here after what we talked about last week. Then we have the story of Zacchaeus. And then right after that follows uh, this uh, pretty familiar story, though. I think we're more familiar with the case, uh, the account of it in Matthew. And we'll talk a little bit about the difference uh, in those here. But uh, Luke 19, starting in verse 11, it says, While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Uh, well, listening to this means uh, what he was saying about Zacchaeus. Uh, that today salvations come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And while they're hearing this, uh, then he went on to tell them, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Why? It says, because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king. And then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made our king, however, or he was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, he, the master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it and laid it away in a piece of cloth. It, I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew 
Did you that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit in the bank so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. Sir, they said, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has more, to who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who do not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. (laughs) Uh, We we say, Jesus, you know, the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. That last line begs to differ, I think. Uh, But he's the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, He's a a God of justice. He's a God that, that judges right from wrong. He's a God that punishes. Uh, evil. We saw it displayed more uh, in the Old Testament outrightly because he was giving us an example uh, with the Israelites, uh, and we should learn from that. But God is still a God of justice. He's still a God who punishes the wrong and those who choose not to follow him and who, and who oppose him. But he's a God that loves, and we see, we'll see that here uh, in this text. Let's pray. Lord God, this is an, an easy parable, and so I pray that you just give us understanding. Pray that you uh, speak clearly uh, this morning through your servant and uh, speak into our hearts. We give you this time to you to, uh, to, to, to help us to hear what we need to hear from you, from your word. Illuminate uh, our hearts and our minds this morning, Father. Help us to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this parable uh, is an interesting one because it, it would have sounded familiar to the Jews, not the whole parable, but the setup for it. Uh, they knew uh, of a king that did very similar things to this. Not the whole thing with the minas, but when King Herod died, the king that was the king at Jesus' birth, he divided up his, um, his kingdom, which is the Palestinian area, uh, into three parts, technically a fourth part too. But he had three sons, and he left in his will for it to be divided up among his sons. Well, Archelaus, uh, one of the sons, felt like it all should belong to him and not to his brother Antipas and Philip. And so... He went to Rome and pleaded for the kingdom. And the Caesar, Caesar Augustus said, yeah, you know, I'll give you the main part. What you're, I'm going to honor what your father said. I'm going to give you the main part, which is Judea, where Jerusalem is, um, and some of the other bigger portions. But I'm going to divide it up. You're going to be the main guy. You're going to be my main man there, but I'm not going to let name you king. I'm going to name you ethnarch, which is like a lesser type of a title. And so you had, um, you had Herod Archelaus in the southern area of, um, of Judea. And then you had Herod Antipas, who's the one who put to death John the Baptist and uh, and Jesus along with Pilate. Eventually Archelaus, just for, for you history buffs and people who want to know, a little bit more about the, the story. It doesn't really relate here, but Archelaus, was even, he eventually died. And um, so instead of putting another Herod, uh, from, someone from Herod's line in there, then the Caesar put Pilate to be the governor. And so he put a Roman in charge of that area. And so that's how you then end up with at Jesus' death. You got Pontius Pilate, ruling Archelaus' area of Judea, and then Herod Antipas, or also, you know, he called himself King Herod, up in the Galilee region, and Pilate and Herod kept sending Jesus back and forth, right, between them, if you remember that. So um, that's, that's kind of this, his, this, this historical background here. So when Archelaus, he did go off to get a kingdom, and the people, though, the Jews, did not like Archelaus. Because he wasn't really one of them. Uh, and so 
they sent a delegation after him and they said, we don't want this guy to be our king. And that is why Augustus listened to, um, to the people rather than to Archelaus. So very similar to this, the beginning part of this parable that would have resonated in the Jews. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're kind of talking about Archelaus here. But, um, but Jesus talks about this king, this nobleman who goes off to get his kingdom to become king. And there's a delegation that, that goes after him and says, we don't want him to be the king. But then you've also got the slaves that were put in charge while he was gone and were given minas, which was about a year's salary uh, for the average person. And, and, they, and they were each 10 of these slaves, which would, when we say slave, we're not thinking, uh, you know, American slavery. Uh, slave would be somebody, who, a manager of the household, but they didn't have their freedom. But they were, you know, they had, um, they had a pretty good, pretty good life. Um, and they were in, put in charge of a lot of things. And so uh, they were each given one mina each to do with it what they could, to invest in, in it, to, to, have, to, take, to take part in business, he said. All right? So why does Jesus tell this parable now? What's the point of this parable? It's a familiar one that, you know, a lot of us have, have, have heard. It's like, you know, well, don't waste the talents that God have, God's given you. And a lot of times we get to that whole idea of don't waste your talents because in Matthew, he doesn't use the word minas. He used the word talents. But talents is just a, another sum of money. It doesn't mean your abilities. But we, we uh, allegorize it and we, you know, make a, a metaphor out of it and say the talents are like our talents and abilities and we shouldn't waste them. Yeah, there's some truth to that, but that's really not the, at the heart of what Jesus is trying to, to get at. And it, as I've said many times as we've studied parables, what is one of the one things that we need to understand to help us understand the parable? It's the setup. Right? Why is he telling us? And a lot of times it tells us why he's telling this parable at this time. So go back to the setup. In verse 11, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because, here's why he's, he's telling it, because he was near Jerusalem. This is the last teaching before they go into Jerusalem, before he rides in on the donkey. Uh, he, he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So Jesus is looking around. He just talks to, to Zacchaeus and explains that to, you know, to them that the purpose of the Son of Man is to come and to seek and to save the lost. And, and look at this, Zacchaeus, he's one of the sons of Abraham. And they're, boom, their Jewish ears perk up. The sons of Abraham, yeah, we're sons of Abraham. Jesus is coming to restore the kingdom and to restore Israel. And they're getting all excited. We're moving into Jerusalem now. We finally, we, we've been traveling around for all this time. We, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem, but now he's actually, we're, we're, we're here. We can see Jerusalem. The kingdom's coming. He's going to go and overthrow the Romans. Right? He's going to restore us to our former glory. And they're excited for this. It's going to happen at once, they thought. And Jesus is looking at them and he knows they don't get it. They don't, they, he knows that they don't understand why he's here. Even though he's explained it many a times, as we saw, God has hidden it from their hearts. And so they're all excited. He's like, okay, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be severely disappointed if your hopes are in a physical, earthly kingdom. And he doesn't want them to be disappointed. Now we, we're going to see it, Jesus' death. And even at his, uh, uh, his arrest, what do, the, what do the disciples do? They scatter. What does Peter, his most loyal uh, disciple, do? Runs and denies him three times. I never knew this guy who I loved and said I would stand up for. Denies him three times. Why? Because they're disappointed. Because this is not what we signed up for. 
We signed up to overthrow the Romans. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna come and, and, and lead the army, yeah, we're with you. We got our two swords and we got your power. We can do this. But that's not what Jesus was about. And he warned them with this parable. You're not going to get what you want, what you think you want, and what you think is good for you. You're not going to get that now. It's later. But for now, you got work to do. And they're not going to understand this until the resurrection. And as, we, and as we see in the parable, many... Many disciples, many followers would never understand this. But the 12 are going to get it. It won't be until Jesus resurrects. But they will get it. So he gives, he gives them this warning. And, and, and they'll remember that a lot of these things that Jesus taught them, they didn't understand. It was hidden from their hearts in Jesus' presence. There will be this aha. Their, their eyes are opened afterwards and 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 then that's why they write these things down so that and and they have they can explain them they can help us understand them because now they understand them but they didn't understand it at the time so what do the minas represent then it'd be nice to know we don't know uh jesus didn't say but in this context we can figure out probably it had to do with Jesus' teaching. All the discipleship that he's been pouring into them and now go and make disciples, this is what you need to be doing. I've invested in you. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to bury it? Are you going to put it in a handkerchief? Put it on your mattress? Or are you going to go and do something with it? And if all you were waiting for is for Jesus to come back and restore an earthly kingdom, you're going to do nothing. And you're going to miss out on what your purpose is. So we've got these uh, three different people in the story and that we can like, try and evaluate today. Who do I identify with more? There's the good slave, good slaves. There's the wicked slave. And then there are the citizens that were enemies. So this morning as we talk about each of these things, and, and the sermon is going to be a little bit shorter because uh, we got Kellen and Marissa going to show up, or I'm going to try and make it a little bit shorter. But we got the good slave, we got the wicked slave, and we got the citizens. Think today, which one am I right now? Okay. At times you might have been the good slave, at times you might have been the wicked slave, at times you might have been the enemy, but right now in your life, how things are going, where would you put yourself? So the good slave, uh, these are the ones that obeyed him. They understood, okay, the master's gone, but he's going to come back, and I've got work to do. He's given me this mina, this year's sum of salary, uh, and I've got to invest it. He's going to expect that I do something with this. These are the obedient ones. They understood their master. They understood what he expected. They understood that he wasn't coming back right away and that there was work to do. How about you? Are you, are you the, the, the obedient slave? You know, what we can expect that, you know, like put all our hopes in this election. This election will have consequences. Don't get me wrong. Is it an important election? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a big difference, most likely in our country. But that is not where our hope is. And if our hope is in this kingdom and in this world and this life, we are like the wicked slave. Our hope has to be in an eternal kingdom. Our hope has to be in what you and I do here now with the gifts that God has given us, with God's word, the truth that we have. What is God calling us to do? He told his disciples when he, when he was about to ascend, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He told us what we're supposed to be about are we doing it? Are you doing it? Are you a good slave? 
We know we're supposed to be seeking first the kingdom of God. First the kingdom of God, not the leftovers. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not we seek our own life and then we give God whatever extra money or, or time or energy that we have. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, now I'll add all these things for you. Don't worry about your life. You're worrying about the wrong things if you're worrying about your life. Seek first the kingdom of God. We know what we're supposed to be about. Seek first the kingdom. Make disciples. Evangelize. Love people. Show them Jesus. Be the church. 1 Corinthians 14.12. 1 Corinthians 14.12 says, So also you, since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts to edify the church, to build up the church. What are you doing? How are you serving in the church with your gifts? It doesn't have to be an official role of some official capacity. It can be an unofficial one. It can just be by loving people and being generous and caring about people, uh, encouraging people. Or it could be something more depending on what your gift is. You could have the gift of mercy. And so, you know, you're going out and you're visiting people who are shut in. You have the gift of faith and you're praying for people boldly. You're on your knees. You know, what, what, what is your gift and how are you using it to edify the church? There's a reason that we're given spiritual gifts. This is what we're supposed to be about. Are we good slaves who are about the kingdom, about making uh, something of the, the, the money that God's given us, the, 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 the talents, the mina that he's given us? So point one, Jesus is calling you to be his hands and feet. Jesus is calling you and me to be his hands and his feet. And you know what? We see in this, in this parable, we're doing this in a hostile world. Because the, 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 the servants <clears throat> were doing this. They were given this to, to serve their master in a world at that time where the citizens hated their master. And they're still supposed to do business with the money that he's given and expand his kingdom. Now they're given more responsibility um, when he comes back. But we are to be doing this in a hostile world. And this world is getting way more hostile towards Christians in America. I mean, there's other countries where it's been like this for a long time. We're finally, you know, we've talked about this. Well, at least we don't have persecution in America. We got persecution in America. If you're a Christian... If you profess to be a Christian, especially an evangelical, an evangelical, let me, uh, for those who don't know what this word means, okay, um, a lot of people hear evangelical and they think right-wing party, Republican party, you know, that, that's not what evangelical means. Um, there is not an evangelical party. Uh, evangelical means that, that you believe that God's word is actually his word, Okay. Um, and that if Jesus said it, if it's in here, it's true. And so we believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. If you're not evangelical, you don't believe that. An evangelical believes that, that God is one in three persons, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's a lot of Christian uh, type denominations that have said, well, we want to take the things out of here that we like, like Jesus' love, but any of the hard stuff where he calls certain things sin, no. Any of the hard stuff like that there's a hell that God sends people to who rebel against him, no, we're not going to believe that. And they pick and choose and they allegorize whatever they want to, make metaphors out of it so they don't have to really believe it. Evangelicals say, no, we are people of the book. Mennonite brethren are, were accused of being or called people of the book. So we are people of the book. We're evangelicals. But if you say you're an evangelical today, what, what does everybody think? You put that horrible Trump in office. And so you're a racist and a misogynist and all the bad words and slanderous words because you're an evangelical. If you're a Christian today, 
especially in the evangelical. You are somebody who hates the LGBTQ community. You don't care for the poor. You don't care for the foreigner. Now, I'm not saying that's true. You know, right or wrong, truth or not, that is how you are perceived. That is how we are perceived, and that is what we are up against. It used to be that when you wanted to evangelize and you wanted to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with people, you were doing it in a world, in a culture that at least respected Christians. They were just ignorant to who Jesus was and what salvation meant. But at least there was some kind of respect and rapport. Oh, Christians, you guys are nice people and stuff. Oh, that's what you believe? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and then maybe they're open to hearing about Jesus. We do not live in that world anymore. We live in a world, in a country that hates and despises Christians, especially evangelicals who say we're going to live by the book. Just like in this parable. And we have to do something with the minas in a hostile world. And we got to figure out how to do that. You know, there's an old saying that they, that they won't care how much you know unless they know how much you care. I remember sitting in Chuck Swindoll's church while I was in college and I heard him say that uh, people will not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that was true then, and it's even more true now. We have got to show the world that we care. We can't just have battles and arguments for truth. It, it won't go anywhere today. We need those. We need to be educated in those. But if that's just our starting point, we're not going to get anywhere with anybody. We have got to communicate love and concern for the outcasts and the, and the poor, the, the, the people that are pushed away in our world. If they don't know that we care, they're not going to want to hear anything from us. And I want to you know, tell you, there's a, there's a, a flyer in your uh, pew uh, called the Discipleship U, which is what we, our discipleship program here, our classes that, and stuff that we do. We're going to be starting in October E, the E series, what we're calling the E series, evangelize and, uh, or sorry, equip and edify, and I forget the order that I put them in, uh, empower. Um, but these opportunities to come together, it's going to be on Zoom because of COVID, and this allows um, everybody or most people who can get on Zoom at least uh, to have an opportunity to participate, whether they have to be homebound or not. Uh, and there's five different opportunities on different times, different nights of the week. And so you can, uh, you can take all of them if you want. Uh, but there's going to be a class on evangelism that Roger Megley uh, will be leading. I'll be leading one on apologetics or how to defend your faith. We've got to learn how to argue our faith and, 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 and know is this true or not. Uh, but you know, that, even though that's maybe not our, st our starting point, it's important. Uh, Pastor Bev is going to be talking on Monday, Monday afternoons to, to ladies who want to be in, just have a, these are going to be discussion based. Um, so that's going to be sit and listen for a long time to one person talk, but it's going to be discussion based uh, about the trying times that we're in and how do we process that and where is God in all of this. Uh, Pastor Grant's going to be talking about um, uh, how, how to put your faith in action. You know, how relevant is that to what we're talking about this morning? Uh, and uh, and uh, Brad Vogel is going to be taking a, a course that he taught in college and putting it into four weeks of discussion on worship and what it means to worship God because we've got to love God first. And so if you're not feeling like you've got a good relationship with God, you don't really know him, take that class and learn how to worship. And truly, what does it mean to worship? All right, great. You can take all of them. You can take any of them. Just, uh, just email the person. Uh, who's leading the class so they can give you the Zoom invite and another four or five week long classes. Uh, for those online, we'll put that up on the website and you'll see that if it's not up there already. All right, how about maybe you're the second type of servant. We'll go through these a little quicker. The wicked servant. The wicked servant didn't do anything. Why didn't he do anything? 
because he didn't know his master. He didn't understand them. He accused him of being this hard guy. And, and really, was he a hard guy? He was just, but was he a hard guy? No, I mean, he, he gave, we see his heart. Uh, he gave them each a mina to, to work with. And when he came back, he rewarded them. You know, I mean, and, and gave him charge over cities. And that's pretty generous. So really was this a hard guy who's just reaping where he doesn't sow and just taking, 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 taking? No, he wasn't. But this guy didn't understand. This, this servant did not understand his master. So if you're more like the wicked servant who right now you're not doing very much or anything with God, maybe you sit in the pew, you're a, a cultural Christian, this might be you. What do you need to do? Jesus, point two, Jesus is inviting you to get to know him. Get to know him. Because he's a good God. He loves you. And get to know his plan. And we're going to talk about that in October, uh, about the second coming. But um, he's, he's a God who, yeah, he is going to come back. He will return. And during this time while he's away, what do we need to do? Get to know him. Get to know what he wants. Get to know your gifts. What, how has God blessed you? How is the Holy Spirit? Maybe I mean, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit is in you, and the Holy Spirit has given you some kind of a gift to use. Get to know it. How often do you spend quality time in prayer and God's word? Are you in a life group or any kind of a small group to help you grow and do something with your faith? Um, this, this servant, you know, was he a Christian or not? Doesn't look like it because he didn't have a relationship with his master, but we don't know for sure. He was, his mind, it was taken away and it was given away. He wasn't slaughtered. He wasn't killed. But in the story of Matthew in Matthew's gospel of it, uh, yeah, he was, he was the one that was, uh, sent to hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So uh, we don't know for sure, but most likely he was not a Christian. He was somebody who considered himself a Christian. It was like the tares in the, in the parable, the wheat and the tares. They grow up together, and you're not sure which one's the wheat and which one is the weed. Because they look the same until a certain point, until they're fully grown. And that's the time of the judgment. In our pews, based on the survey, uh, you know, like Barna, a good, uh, at least probably 50% of people are not actually saved who come to churches. But they think they are because they're coming to church. But they don't know him. Get to know him. How often do you spend quality time in prayer and God's word? Uh, do that. If, you, if you're not sure whether you're saved or not, if you're just a cultural Christian, come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you about that. And then there's a third category. Last one is the enemies. They sought out to actively prevent the kingdom from happening. They're actively trying to stop the kingdom. We don't want this guy to be our king. This, in the story, obviously, uh, in Jesus' time, would be those who put him to death. And so Jesus was predicting through this that there's going to be people that, be people that are going to actually uh, try and stop the kingdom from happening. But the thing is, they can't do it because they put him to death, which is exactly what he wanted them to do. Uh, and uh, they, and, you know, and he, and he conquered death to give us life. Are you an enemy? Probably not too many in here, but there, there could be. And there could be some on, online. Uh, What's Jesus warning you? He's warning you in this to not oppose him. Don't oppose him. You're on the wrong side. If you are an enemy of the church, God's people, you're the enemy of truth, you're on the wrong side. Be careful. Just, uh, yeah. Uh, it, I don't say that 
in a way that, you know, to, to, to make God look out like, like, to look like he's vengeful. God's not vengeful, but he will get, you know, vengeance. But it's because of he's a just God, and it would not be fair. We, we would think he's not a very good God if he's not just and if he doesn't punish unrighteousness. But this just God who has to, by being fair, by being, a, by being just, which we all like, has to punish wickedness. But at the same time, because he loves us so much, he sent his son to die on the cross for us so that we can be forgiven. So that even though we couldn't forgive ourselves or do anything good enough to earn salvation, so I'll do it for you. That's a loving God. We've got a just God, but we've got a merciful God. It's a wonderful marriage of those, those two concepts. He's just, but he's merciful. And so if you don't, if you don't know him, if you, you've been opposing him, if you've been, you know, putting your heels in the ground and just say, I will not ever follow that king. I will not ever follow God. You're rebellious. Jesus died for you. Jesus loves you. And if you wonder where he is, if, you know, he, he's not hurting me now, I've, I've been living fine without him. Just you wait. It's coming. God is patient, he says. He wants none to perish. He doesn't want you to perish. He's being patient with you. How long are you going to hold out, though? It will end. The judgment's coming. You know, we wonder as we look around the world today how hostile it is towards Christians, how wicked it is becoming, at least in our country. You wonder, how much longer can this go on? I'm sure we're all thinking it right now. Like how much worse can it get? Jesus is coming again. It might still be a while, but it might be around the corner. Are you ready? If he does, let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this, this parable that you gave us. You didn't want us to be in the dark. You didn't want us to wonder, well, uh, when you left, what are you doing? This isn't what we expected. You were wrong. You set us up. No, you, you predicted what it was going to happen and, and how it was going to happen. You knew this. And you tried to warn us. Help us, Lord, to be people that are like the good slave, that, that listen to you, that obey, that, that love and care for the poor with truth. That we love and care for them because you love and care for them. Have a heart for them. And that we, that we care for those who are lost. That we don't look at people who disagree with this, that hate Christians as our enemies. They're your enemies. They're not our enemies. And they're people that need help. They need the light. They need you. And Lord, we pray that we will be a church that will be a light in this dark, dark world. We can only do that with you. And that's why we sing this morning to you. That's why we give you praise. That's why we worship you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, just a quick word about the raucous sound that interrupted Karen's prelude and caused no end of panic in the tech booth. <laughs> If you remember last week when Bev and Grant gave announcements and you could hardly hear what was going on, <laughs> that microphone was reading out on a meter very um, strongly. And once we shut that down, we think the sound went away. So at any rate, that was the, the dying gasp of mic number five. And we hope not to hear that again. Please stand as we sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say. The song of the redeemed rising from the African plain. It's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers filled with God's holy power. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation. A love song born of a grateful heart. 
It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Hallelujah, he reigns. He reigns. Let it rise above the four winds, caught up in the heavenly song. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none were truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. Where's all God's children singing glory, glory? Hallelujah, He reigns, He reigns. All God's children singing glory, glory. He does reign. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you are in control and we don't have to be. Uh, you are a good God, all powerful, almighty, all knowing, and we can trust you. And that is good. Help us to take ourselves off of the throne of our hearts and our lives and give you the kingdom, give you the control because you are good and you reign. And we want to be on your side. And I pray for those, who, Lord, who don't know you yet, that they would come to know you, that they would put their trust in you. It's how good it is to be in the center of your will. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you don't know Jesus, I invite you to come talk to me, email me, whatever. Let's set up a time to talk about that. If you've got questions, I know I didn't answer all the questions in this parable. If you want to talk more about that, let's do that too. But let's uh, close with the doxology uh, and... Uh, Give him more glory. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here. 